At its core, voting is something that allows democracy, a big conceptual idea, to become reality. You can bring democracy as an idea into real action. Voting is something that allows citizens to have a say in who governs them and how. But for the system to work, there has to be trust. Trust that every eligible voter would be allowed to vote. Trust that the voters vote would be counted as caste. Trust that the system is fair. Otherwise, you are promising biryani, but serving plain rice. Right? In India, we have been an aggressive and confident adopter of technology. We have gone from paper ballots to electronic voting machines faster than most nations could finish debating about the safety of employing technology in this setting. We have jumped from handwritten electoral rolls pasted outside polling booths to accessible PDFs which could be searched over your mobile apps. These technological shifts have brought real advantages. Faster counting, of course, but very accessible election and incredibly simplifying the election logistics. But with this transition, new considerations have arisen. The need for safeguarding against voter profiling and the need for improved transparency. The good news is that these considerations, these challenges are all solvable. We have the tools and the technologies to address them. So today, I want to talk how can we continue evolving our election technology by further improving the public understanding of these systems, making them verifiable to public and making them explainable to public at large, not just to the digitally savvy folks in the cities, but to that farmer who's sitting in Vidharva or to that teacher who is teaching in Nagaland. So let's start with a big question. How do you even make a voting technology trustworthy? There are few key properties which are at the foundation of creating trustworthy technology and they reside in democracy. Across world, you would find democracies residing in these ideals. The first is verifiability. From the voter's perspective, verifiability essentially means that a voter's vote is recorded as cast and counted as recorded. So it's a composition of these two properties. For candidates, verifiability is also important. Candidates would want to know that the election has been conducted in a transparent and tamper resistant manner. That the outcome of an election, be it a victory or a loss, is not a result of a technological glitch or some hidden algorithm, but of a genuine public choice. These guarantees are extremely important to be given by these voting technologies. Otherwise, it's like being told after losing a cricket match that, don't worry, we know why you have lost the DRS system has told us, except that nobody administering the DRS system got to see the replays and the third umpire is not willing to explain their decision. Then comes privacy. In India, we all care about privacy, unless of course it involves a curious neighbor who wants to know what is your salary package or why have you not been married yet. But jokes apart, voter privacy is extremely important to protect voters from coercion, manipulation and surveillance. Voter privacy is important for voters to ensure that their vote that has been cast is not linked to their real identities. For candidates too, voter privacy is extremely important. Candidates want to ensure that the voter participation data has not been used for micro-targeting, has not been used to suppress certain voting groups. There have been cases in the past like Cambridge Analytica, its use in the US elections, Voter Vault in the UK. These 
events highlight the risks of aggregating voter profiles. Third property of interest is integrity. These voting systems must ensure that eligible voters get to vote, but vote only once. No ineligible voter should be allowed to cast a ballot. And those who could successfully cast a ballot, their vote remains unaltered up to the final tally and beyond. And finally, auditability. The democratic version of Control Z. If something looks fishy, you should be able to say, Jara check karo bhai. And not get stonewalled by responses such as, system to aise hi chalta hai. Auditability means that we just don't trust the result, but we also verify how did we arrive at the result. It's not just who won, but whether the process itself was clean and explainable to voters and candidates. Voters, observers, losing candidates should be able to initiate audits and ideally walk away with a response, fair enough, I'm convinced. These are the essential four properties which reside in democratic principles. Now, having looked at these principles, let's zoom out a little and try to understand the global landscape of electronic voting technologies and where does India stand. The first and foremost are called direct record electronic voting machines or in other words, DRE machines. They have been found to be used in some parts of the US, Brazil and in some parts of Europe. Extremely easy to use. They provide you a touch screen. You walk into a polling booth, press a button, your vote gets recorded. But if something goes south, then it's your word against the machine's word. So while incredibly easy to use, there is a problem. You cannot obtain a proof that your vote was indeed recorded as cast. The next kind of voting machines are called end-to-end -end verifiable voting machines. In fact, they are augmented on top of DRE machines. The end-to-end -end verifiability guarantee is orchestrated through cryptography, very sophisticated set of procedures in computer science that allows voters to convince themselves that yes, their vote has been recorded as cast and counted as recorded in the final tally. They are highly transparent and extremely secure. But the downside of E2E voting systems, which are slapped on top of DRE systems, is the fact that sometimes it can make voters feel as if they are solving a math puzzle while voting. So the clear downside is that these technologies may not be appropriate for electorates with very high diversity, with different literacy levels. And finally, internet voting. Estonia is a great example where internet voting takes place. In fact, in India, there have been discussions surrounding internet voting. What does it allow you to do? Well, you can use your digital identity, use a mobile phone, sitting at your home or in your office, you can cast your ballot. Extremely simple. So while you are sipping a cup of chai or coffee, you can vote for your preferred candidate. But its downsides outweigh its positives. It's an extremely difficult system to be made foolproof against hacking attacks. Why is that the case? Because it is connected to the internet. The attack surface has enlarged substantially. More so, internet voting is not appropriate for electorates or for societies which have witnessed coercive voting. In fact, I would go a step further and say that internet voting cannot be made coercion resistant. So having understood these four different technology types, let's try to understand where do Indian EVMs stand. Indian EVMs are proudly homegrown and distinctly unique. They are the railway system of the election world. The Indian railways are very, very popular because of their incredible robustness, by choice, low tech, and ability to move millions without a glitch. Indian EVMs are very much like that. They are standalone devices not connected to the internet. And this design is consciously made to make sure that hacking risks are minimized. In addition, they, they come with something called as voter verified paper audit trails. These are paper slips 
that voter gets to see after they have cast their ballot. This gives Indian EVMs and Indian elections relatively more verifiability than some of the older DRE machines that have been used in the US. They have very simple UI. The ballot and the machine is based on icons that are specifically designed for the different literacy levels that exist in India. They're extremely robust. You can conduct elections by setting up polls in a mountain pass or in a desert tent. Very robust, dustproof technology. So in summary, Indian EVMs strike a pragmatic middle path. They are designed for the Indian context, delivering scale, speed, and reasonable security. But as technology has advanced and expectations have evolved in the society, the real question is, how can we improve these technologies without breaking what already works wonderfully? So let's talk about solutions and focus on electoral rolls as the first point. Electoral rolls are public. That sounds very democratic. They are the foundation of who gets to vote. Events in the past like that of Cambridge Analytica and Voter Vault indicate that public electoral rolls, when not safeguarded properly, can lead to micro-targeting or exclusion. The research at Ashoka University and at IIT Delhi presents a protocol that allows for the creation of privacy-preserving electoral rolls that allow voters to self-check their inclusion in the electoral rolls, for the auditors to identify fake or duplicate entities, and all of this without making electoral rolls public so as to avoid micro-targeting. Second solution, our Indian EVMs do provide voter verified paper audit trails. It provides a one-time visual confirmation but no way to track beyond that confirmation point that your vote indeed has appeared in the final tally. The same team from Ashoka and IIT Delhi demonstrates that existing technology can be augmented with explainable and verifiable end-to-end -end cryptographic solution, which allows voters to verify that their vote has been counted as cast. Results can be audited mathematically by the auditors. And for the administrators who are conducting the elections, they can comprehensively address EVM rigging rumors. And most interestingly, these systems do not require overhauling of the current infrastructure. They can integrate with existing technology, the EVMs and VV pads, making them evolutionary and not revolutionary. Finally, to conclude, for a country as large as India, as diverse and vibrant as India, elections are not just a civic exercise, they are festivals. Over the years, India has pioneered large-scale electoral in innovation. We went digital when digital as a word was not even fashionable. Our EVMs cater to 900 million voters, unmatched worldwide. With decades of this experience and with newer expectations and the evolving technological landscape, the question is, how can we innovate responsibly to meet newer expectations? Our own research and that of others has offered solutions to protect voter privacy while still en enabling public audits of electoral rolls, make electronic vote recording verifiable over and above VVPATs by the voters, by the auditors, protect and prevent the denial of voting rights via transparent protocols, that's number three. And in, as a fourth point, we provide solutions to implement risk-limiting audits so that trust is earned and not assumed. In 2009, the German Supreme Court made a landmark ruling saying that if an average voter cannot understand voting technology, then that technology violates democratic principles. That's a high bar and perhaps too rigid for a country as diverse and large as ours. But the spirit of the judgment is very clear. Technology must stay accountable to the people it serves. It's not the rejection of innovation. It's a reminder to us as engineers and developers and innovators that can we build systems that are both high-tech and are publicly explainable and verifiable. Because in elections, trust doesn't come from complexity. 
it comes from clarity. And democracy does not need to fear technology so long as technology does not fear scrutiny. As someone wise has said, if the source code of democracy is open, the doors of suspicion stay shut. Thank you.